Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Albert Ferrier. I'm here with Stefan Heinotzi. We're both from Red Hat. Uh, and this is a presentation about LibLock.io, uh, a high-performance Block.io API. So to get started, let's uh, do a brief recap of what Block devices are. Uh, in this presentation by a block device, we really just mean the, uh, the, the general storage abstraction, uh, which is essentially an array of blocks of bytes. So blocks are fixed size, and the array of blocks uh, also has a fixed size. So the number of blocks is, is fixed. So most NVMe devices and SCSI devices and virtual block devices uh, follow this block device model and are block devices. Now, the way a user would interact with block device is by submitting requests. And the most simple kinds of requests will be reads and writes, right? Just to read one or more blocks or write one or more blocks uh, at once. Some block accesses aren't possible with block, block devices, not possible to read or write just part of a block, uh, only one or more <coughs> blocks at once. Other kinds of requests are, are flush, uh, which ensures that data is, is persistently stored, and there's also discard, write zeros, uh, perhaps a couple more in some devices, etc. And block devices appear or are used really uh, everywhere, pretty much. Although directly, it's usually more in infrastructure. So things like databases and file systems and hypervisors. Applications can also use block devices directly, and many do, but perhaps most commonly uh, they use uh, a file system or some other high-level storage abstraction, which in turn uses a, a block device. So LibLock.io, the, uh, the library we're representing here, actually came out of, of Humu. So in Qemu, there's uh, block drivers. And over time, Qemu really accumulated a lot of different block drivers, from simple IO Euring bindings to actual user space and VME drivers. Uh, and still more, more drivers were needed, uh, in particular, recently, the uh, Vertio Block Vhost VDPA and Vertio Block Vhost User. Uh, but the code for these drivers really, uh, although it is Qemu specific, it, it generally is, it could be made more generic and could be used by other applications, but the way it is written, uh, it is specific and embedded in Qemu. So we decided to develop these new drivers in a separate library. And that's really where, <coughs> sorry, where LibLock.io comes in. Um, so today there are quite a few different Block.io interfaces, which are all interfaces to access Block uh, devices, uh, but they all kind of differ from each other in, in certain respects, have some advantages, disadvantages um, and different applicability. So just plain old POSIX read and write system calls is, is very simple uh, and device agnostic can access a lot of block, different block devices uh, as long as the, uh, the kernel supports them. IO Euring uh, in Linux is uh, similar but asynchronous and, and can, can get this less system call overhead. Um, more, more recently even, <coughs> More recently, even IO Euring also supports Euring CMD, uh, which allows us to submit NVMe commands more directly to an NVMe device uh, by passing the VFS. Um, and it's also possible you know, to implement user space NVMe drivers and user space VFIO drivers, virtual block drivers, sorry. Uh, and there's also things like VHOS VDPA to access <coughs> a slice of physical virtual block devices. Sorry. Sorry, Stefan, could you take the spot? No worries. Yeah, so um, so I'll move on to the, to the next interface that Beto wanted to um, mention. Um, we also have vhost user block, which is used um, in, uh, for example, connecting SPDK processes to QEMU VMs. Um, so what we've got here is we've got a lot of different storage interfaces, and they seem to keep growing at the moment. There's more and more of them. But what's the same? What do they all have in common? Um, well, they all have the same basic types of I.O. requests, like reads, writes, flush, discard, write zeros. Um, they have the concept of queues. But the problem is, if you're developing an application that uses uh, block I.O., then implementing one takes f some amount of effort. But when you implement the next one, all the little details are going to be different. If it's a descriptor ring, the layout's going to be different. Does it support polling? How do you integrate it into your event loop? Um, and are there any IO memory buffer constraints? That's something we'll get into later. All these little things are kind of different between these different interfaces. So uh, that means that the, the overhead of adding support for another one uh, is relatively high. It's going to take you time to implement. Um, all right. Do you want to? Okay. <clears throat> 
Um, okay, so that's where LibBlockIO comes in. <laughs> so that was the idea that we ha have all these things. We're seeing a lot of duplication of implementing, say, IOU ring support uh, and so on. And uh, we'd like to be able to take that and have a library that does that um, so that applications, not just QEMU, can, can use it. Again, going back to kind of our initial uh, reason for doing this, um, yes, we can do it in QEMU and we can invest the time and effort in implementing these block drivers, but then when some other program also wants to access the same kind of storage in order to get to the disk images that we want to share from our VMs, we can't because the effort's going to be significant in duplicating that again. So we've got libblock.io. Um, it can be used for all these use cases if you have a, a database uh, or a file system. Um, um, obviously, all the emulators and, and, and hypervisors that, uh, that are doing block.io, uh, and also I.O. frameworks um, uh, can use it, as well as the backup and forensics and disk imaging tools. So what is libblock.io? It's a C API. The actual library itself is implemented in Rust, but it's a C API because we want it to be easy to integrate into applications written in any language. Um, and it provides these different drivers that we, we mentioned um, so that you have access to these different block IO interfaces all through a unified API. The, um, the drivers that uh, we include at the moment, we've just made the lib block IO 1.0 release. Uh, we have an IO Uring driver. We have the IO Uring NVMe uh, Uring command driver that Abato wrote. Uh, there's a Verdeo block uh, VFAO PCI driver, a Verdeo block vhost VDPA, and a Verdeo block uh, vhost user driver. So you already get quite a few drivers, and we're hoping that in the future, um, basically, when we develop new drivers, we can do it here in libblock.io so that it's easy to share and reuse. Um, to give you kind of an idea of, of how the API is used and, and, and how you would uh, use libblock.io in your own application, um, you start by creating a, a block.io instance, and you can tell libblock.io which driver you want. Like right here, we, 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 want, lib, uh, we want IO uring. Uh, at that point, you've created the instance but you haven't set it up yet. You haven't configured it. Um, so you can, you can set, for example, with an IOU ring file, you can have a path that you want to set in order to tell it which file to open. So there's some API calls you can make to do that. Whatever type of driver, whatever type of storage is, here's where you set up your connection. And then you call block IO connect to get a connected instance. At this point, you can do the last minute uh, setup, things like how many queues would you like, um, and so on and then you start the instance, and at that point, you can get the queues, you can submit I.O. So that's, that's the, the life cycle. Um, and the queues themselves, they're um, uh, typically the, the, the model for queues and storage and block devices is that they're all independent. Um, some applications might want to implement their own thread safety if they're multi-threaded, but a typical thing is for each thread to have its own queue, especially if you do thread per core then it's very straightforward and you don't need to worry about locking. Every thread just has its own queue. Um, okay. So the typical queue semantics that block devices have are also what the library does. That means there's no request ordering uh, either within or between queues. And that's normal because applications that do block IO, they have to do this themselves. So if they want to make sure that one request completes before another, um, they would have to wait for that first request complete. They wouldn't submit them both simultaneously. Uh, one thing that libblock.io abstracts, which can be a bit of a pain when working with low-level devices, is that typically the device has some kind of limit in the number of requests you can put in the queue because the queue has resources like descriptors. Um, and so if you're just writing a, a, a relatively high-level program that's not trying to I don't know, do, lo do low-level stuff and optimize its performance too much, then it can be tedious to build your own kind of uh, uh, flow control mechanism, like some back pressure where you stop when the queue is full. And so libblock.io does have built-in queuing, uh, so you can actually submit as many requests as you want, which makes writing the applications convenient. So it adds a little bit on top, um, because you wouldn't get that if you were uh, just accessing a, 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 a raw device. Okay. So the API offers three different uh, 
I.O. modes for integrating it into your application. The simple one, of course, is the blocking I.O. mode, where you say, do a read, and you block until the read is done. But the limitation of that approach is that you can only do one request at a time per thread. And so that's why um, event-driven applications would not do this. They would take a more async approach, where they can submit as many requests as they want, and then they use their event loop to wait for completions to come in and process them. So that's the event-driven I.O. approach. Their um, um, libblock I.O. provides an event FD kind of thing that you can easily integrate into your event loop. Um, the third type of I.O. is for applications where you're really trying to minimize latency, and that's uh, polled I.O. For polling, um, we actually ended up implementing two different approaches to polling because it depends on your needs. The first is approach is what we call application-level polling. It's where the application itself makes repeated calls into libblock.io to find out if the I.O. it's waiting for is already done. The problem with this, though, is that if you, for example, use I.O. Uring, um, you're not truly getting polling all the way down the stack. Uh, so with the application-level polling approach, you're going to be making system calls to um, ask I.O. Uring um, uh, if there are new requests that have finished. Um, and so you still have uh, IRQs. That means that you still have a CPU overhead of the IRQs that are coming in. And so we also have a dr what we call driver-level polling mode, where the application gives up control. It calls into libblock.io, and libblock.io uh, uh, does the polling. And what that means is we can go down all the way. We can use the Linux I.O. poll feature, set the high pry flag on I.O. requests, which tells the Linux block layer to uh, poll internally in the kernel. So then the NVMe driver, for example, can sit there and spin, and it can submit the requests on a queue that has no interrupt. So then you have no um, interrupt uh, overhead. You don't have uh, to waste CPU doing that. OK, uh, one thing I should mention, you might be thinking, so why did you implement two modes if this one is obviously better? You should always do driver-level polling. And the answer is that with application-level polling, if, if the application actually keeps calling to IOU ring, obviously that means that thread can also do other things. So if it needs to also wait for a socket or something else, then that's a more uh, usable way. Because when you, when you let the driver pull and you do IO pull, then you're kind of stuck to doing just that one thing, monitoring that one device. And any other events you're waiting for, uh, you need another thread to do it. OK. Um, we saw before that in the device lifecycle, uh, part of creating your block IO instance is setting the properties, like the path. And libblock.io drivers actually export a bunch of other properties that you can also read. Some of them you can write. We have things like the maximum transfer size of an I.O. request, which basically tells you, OK, this hardware won't allow you to sub submit requests bigger than you know, whatever um, the, the limit is. Uh, we have memory buffer alignment. So all this kind of information is, can be read out of libblock.io. Um, yeah, the, the number of queues is like the, one of the most obvious one that you would want to set. And so the drivers have this, um, these properties that the application can use to configure them. OK, so that's kind of the basic stuff. This is pretty standard for uh, doing any block I.O. But one of the interesting things is that some of the drivers we support, like vhost user, vhost user block, and VFIO PCI-based devices, like uh, vertio block on VFIO PCI, they don't have the ability to directly access memory, not without some preparation. And so we need to register memory regions first with libblock.io. You can't just take an arbitrary pointer in your virtual address space and do I.O. to and from it like you can with, say, a pread system call. Um, so the reason for that is that, for example, with VFIO, you need to do DMA mapping. You need to program the I.O. MMU so that it knows um, how the, uh, which pages that the hardware can transfer. And so that's why we have a, a, an API for memory regions. And that abstracts this. So it doesn't matter whether you're using VOS user or VFIO. Um, this memory region API allows the application to say, this is where my IO buffers are going to be. I want to register it. And from then on, you can use that memory. And VFIO devices and so on will work. Some of the drivers don't need this. For example, just IO ring by itself. Um, if you don't enable fixed buffers, which is one of the optimizations it has, 
then you, you don't even need to do this. But um, it, it's there, and, and, and an application that wants to use all drivers will have to do it. OK, so the, the basic idea with the memory regions is simply that the application registers any uh, I.O. buffers, any memory, ahead of time before it does the requests, and it can unmap them later if it wants to. There can be a limit on the number. For example, vhost user devices don't support an infinite number of memory regions. Um, so that's, that's also something to, uh, to take care of. And the applications have to do that. OK, so that's kind of the, the basic summary. That's the core of what can libblock.io do? What is it? Uh, it's a unified uh, multi-queue block.io API. And it takes a lot of the, uh, the functionality that we're, we're developing now kind of in the QMU community and putting it somewhere where other programs can also reuse them. OK, so next let's move on to a um, case study. I'll explain how we integrated libblock.io into QMU as a QMU block driver <laughs> and uh, also with some performance evaluation. So. Um, QMU uh, has a full block layer because QMU is an emulator and it emulates all these storage controllers. It emulates IDE controllers and SCSI HPAs and, and so on. And so it's a little bit different from some of the other programs we showed before, like databases, for example, that would probably have a, a more limited set of I.O. request types and API calls that they need to get their job done because they just want to store information. Whereas QMU, since it needs to emulate disks, um, it needs to represent like everything that a disk can do. And so QMU is actually a pretty good proof of concept of integrating libblock.io into an application. If QMU can emulate disks using libblock.io, basically making all the API calls that libblock.io has to offer, then we can be pretty confident that uh, more limited use cases are going to work as well. The drivers that we have for QMU using libblock.io are IOU ring. Verdeo vhost user block and uh, vhost vdpa block. And this takes around 700 lines of code. But like I mentioned, if you want to implement uh, libblock.io support in something else, say, um, you know, say you have a database, um, you probably need less code because you're not going to be calling every single API call and enumerating everything a disk can do. Uh, we expect the driver to land in QMU 7.2, so in the, in the next release. The patches are on the mailing list. So just a recap uh, to see where this fits in, in QMU's architecture. Um, with QMU, when you're running a virtual machine, a guest, the guest submits I.O. requests, and QMU's device emulation code um, uh, picks them up, and um, it passes them to the QMU block layer. Uh, the QMU block layer then has these different block drivers. So it has uh, what we've added to QMU is the block IO uh, block driver, and that is the bridge that connects to the block IO. If you want to know more about block drivers and developing them, there's, there's actually a, a presentation that kind of goes into the details. But um, I'm just going to focus on the, the most interesting part of doing this integration. Most of it was just calling the libblock.io API calls in a straightforward way, but the one area where we kind of have a challenge is how do we deal with the memory where the I.O. buffers reside in QMU? Um, in QMU, we have kind of three types of memory that are used for I.O. requests. We have guest RAM, which is pretty long-lived. It's, it's more or less static. Every once in a while, you might hot plug some RAM, and so that could change. But in general, it's pretty straightforward. But then we have QMU block drivers like the QCA2 image file format or crypto. And what they need to do is they have internal buffers that they need, either for metadata or the crypto driver. It first needs to read the encrypted data, and then it decrypts it into guest RAM. So there's a bounce buffer in between, basically. So we have them. And then we also have some places that do small amounts of I.O., and they, they can just use a, a uh, an I.O. buffer, like a variable somewhere on a stack or heap allocated. So really, th that can be kind of anywhere, and it's not set up in a very organized way. So how do we deal with memory regions? This is a problem that you won't have if you're developing a new application from scratch for libblock.io, 
because then you'll come up with a simple strategy for, okay, let's allocate I.O. buffers here. But if you're integrating it into an existing application, like QEMU here, you're going to have to figure this out. Like, where is my memory located, and how can I register it? So registering the guest RAM in QEMU is easy, because I said it's, it's pretty static. So we can just enumerate it and register it, and if it changes, we just have a callback, and we, we go and we register that new part. The harder part is these, these intermediate buffers that I mentioned that come from within QEMU itself and not are, are not in guest RAM. So there's a few strategies that people take to solve this kind of problem. Uh, one approach might be to just allocate a buffer temporarily and then map it, copy, do, do the mem copy between this new bounce buffer and then unmap the buffer and free it after the request is done. But that's gonna be the most expensive approach. Um, so that's, that's the temporary mappings approach. Another approach is to take a memory pool and map that whole thing, and whenever uh, you need to uh, get a bounce buffer, just use it from the pool. At least that way you avoid doing the mappings uh, and unmapping uh, all the time. Uh, and the final approach would be to go into QEMU source code and find all these places where these, these I.O. buffers come from and change all of them and update them, maybe to use a new API that uh, uh, fetches memory from a place that's already mapped, from a pool that's already mapped. But that's very invasive. And it's very hard to do for the stack and heap buffers, right? Because if it's a stack buffer, then you're actually gonna need to change code significantly to manage this memory if you wanna take it from a pool and release it. So we didn't do that. For the block IO driver in QEMU, we decided uh, to have a pool. And um, that way we can avoid the cost of mapping. But this is definitely something that you would c consider when integrating into other existing applications. Um, in case that like, you're kind of wondering, okay, what's the big deal with the mapping? Why is it expensive and what is it? I, I, I did wanna show this a little bit. Uh, the vhost user block devices might be some of the most expensive ones because if you want to register a memory, uh, first of all, because the device is running in a separate process from your process, uh, so QEMU is running one process, you have the vhost user block device running in another process. Um, how does that other process even access the memory, right? So they have a mechanism for sharing memory. And they send over, over a Unix domain socket, they send over an add region request and pass a file descriptor to that shared memory. And then the vhost user device can mmap it. And if you want to unmap, you do the reverse of that. And so you can see that several system calls are involved, there's IPC involved and so on. So this is gonna be expensive and slow. Uh, and to take a look at that, so what's the cost of, of, of mapping and unmapping? And why is it a good idea to have a good strategy? Um, I, I just ran a, a, a small benchmark with the QEMU storage daemon acting as the vhost user block device. And QEMU talking to it with the libblock.io vhost user block driver. And so the difference between mapping for every single request and unmapping versus having a permanent buffer that's mapped is pretty significant. It's like a three times difference between the two. Um, yeah. Okay, so the, 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 the mapping strategy is very important to, to, to optimize in order to get good performance. But what about the performance of libblock IO itself, right? I wanna show that it has low overhead because if it has high overhead, then you'd probably say, nah, I'd rather just integrate, say, IOU ring directly and not use LeBlock IO. So we wanted to take a look at how expensive it is. Um, that's pretty easy to do because QEMU itself has IOU ring support already. So we can compare QEMU's native IOU ring against LeBlock IO and see what the overhead is there. Um, and so here's a, a benchmark results for, for random reads. Um, and you can see that the, the two bars uh, are pretty close. There are differences. Um, and we'll definitely take a look at those differences uh, now that LeBlock IO 1.0 is released, maybe focus some more on the performance. But this is in microseconds, so these differences are, this is, are relatively small. Um, so you can see native QEMU versus libblock.io doesn't, doesn't add too much overhead. Um, but that's just virtualization. What about just libblock.io and let's get rid of QEMU and, and let's really look at just the bare metal performance. 
uh, Alberto implemented a uh, IO engine for FIO that uh, adds all the, 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 uh, the block IO. So that way, what you can do is you can compare FIO's built-in uh, IOU ring and compare it to libblock IO directly without running a VM, just bare metal application. And uh, he also implemented uh, the polling support, so we can have a look at uh, what that looks like. Um, and on here you can see, first of all, that if you care about latency, you're going to use polling because it's, it's a lot uh, lower latency. But again, you get kind of similar results. Even without the, v v without the VMs, you still see that the bars are pretty close. Um, and we'll still take a look and see how we can optimize this. But uh, it's already uh, looking like uh, it's reasonable to, to say that LeBlockIO has low overhead. OK. So next, I want to move on to some of the future work. What's, what's the direction for LeBlockIO, and what do we still have that we want to do? So in the beginning, I mentioned we have the C API, and that's primarily what the library is. But the library is written in Rust. New things are being written in Rust. And we want to have a native API in Rust. And the reason for that is because if we have a native API, we can actually design the API to be safe. Uh, whereas the C API obviously involves passing a bunch of pointers, uh, assuming that the caller is going to honor like the lifetime of these buffers and, 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 and IOVEX and so on. That responsibility is on the caller. That's not checked by anything. Whereas if we can design a native API for it in Rust, then we can actually make sure that the life cycle is correct and the compiler can help us check it. But that turns out we're not there yet. This is something that, that is a uh, work in progress. Um, at the moment, the, the Rust side of the API, which is experimental and already exists, it's already on crates.io. If you want to grab the block IO crate, uh, you can check it out and get access to this stuff. But you'll find that the, the methods are still just passing raw IOVEC pointers, and they assume that you're going to hold on to those IOVECs until the request is done. We haven't uh, found a nice mechanism to do it yet. And I think we've seen that in Rust, async and threading libraries have the same kind of problem, because you can hand them stuff, move it into a thread, it goes off and does some stuff. Um, and they also have kind of thought about how do we introduce the concept of scopes so that uh, when we have, say, an I.O. buffer that we want to read into, we can scope it and make sure that that I.O. buffer stays alive as long as that request. And so we haven't gotten there yet. And if, if there are Rust people here who are interested in, 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 uh, in this kind of thing, uh, it would be great to, to have more discussion and, and, and also uh, contributions or, or collaboration on that. So uh, Hannah Reitz uh, has been experimenting with uh, using libblock.io just from Rust and, and also integrating it into async uh, Rust code. All right, another big one is that primarily libblock.io is for local storage because that's where the, the kind of really low latency, like sub 10 microsecond uh, kind of uh, things that we've been optimizing uh, are. But of course, there's always the possibility of extending this to remote block devices, block devices that are over a network or some kind of fabric. So if you have NVMe over TCP, why not? You could, you could add a driver to do that uh, to libblock.io as well. Um, but we are aware that the, the libblock.io API, the control path is actually blocking. So when, when I showed you the lifecycle and how you create a device and you, can, you call a connect function and you call a start function, those functions are blocking. They, they're not async. And so if you imagine connecting to an NVMe TCP target and the network is down or the server just doesn't respond for a long time, then it will hang your thread because the block IO is going to be waiting. So at some point, if we want to go there and do network storage drivers, then we probably will need an async API as well. OK, and um, another thing that, that we have uh, in mind and that Stefano Gattarella is working on is queue pass-through. Um, this is not like a general thing that you would probably use for most applications, but for emulators and virtualization, it, it's, it's a very interesting optimization because if your virtual machine is doing NVMe and the underlying device is NVMe, or if your virtual machine is doing vertical block and the under, underlying device is also vertical block, why do we have all these layers in between? Why do we have the, the emulator in between? Why do we have the block in between? What if we could take the queue from the actual device 
and map it into the guest. And then the VM's drivers or application would be accessing that directly and we will be bypassing those queues. So uh, Stefano is currently working on the um, queue pass through APIs. We're gonna start with Verdeo block. And so the idea there is um, let's take the V-ring that the guest has configured and let's uh, pass it down to typically it would either be a vhost user block device or a vhost VDPA block device. Um, so that's uh, also something we're working on. And that's it. Are there any questions? Should I repeat it? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, the, la uh, the last slide. Uh, have you thought about something like crypto, if you if you want to use that uh, DM crypt or some of those blocks in, in the guest uh, block IO and, and not in the uh, host host IO, how, how would that map? Because this is definitely interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Would definitely reduce the layers. Yeah, so I, th I think that um, it definitely depends on, on your use case, like what configuration you're, you're going to have. Um, you can pass through um, a device, like say you have a vhost VDPA block device, basically a hardware Verdeo block device. If you pass it through into a guest, then of course the guest would be the one to do the uh, encryption because now you're bypassing all the layers. Um, so that's like the straightforward way of doing it, but maybe were you, were you thinking of uh, a, a case where you, you can't do the encryption in the guest? I haven't really thought about pass through at all. I was right. thinking more in the direction of block IO being emulated by right. so, VMM. So it means that you lose, you basically lose, if you are bypassing all these layers, you will lose their functionality. So either you have to do it in the guest or in the case of what, uh, what Stefano has been designing, I think that his, uh, his, his goal is to actually have a dynamic mechanism. So when you're not using any features like IO throttling that's done by the hypervisor and stuff like that that needs to intercept IO or maybe encryption, then you take the fast path. But when you enable those features, because some of them are temporary, like maybe during live migration, you need to do storage migration. Okay, then let's not do pass through temporarily. And so the, the queue pass through API is not a static thing that can only be set once. You can flip back and forth at runtime. So that kind of answers some of what you say, because you don't actually lose all the functionality if you can only do the fast path when you need it. Sure, thanks. Do you have um, scripting bindings for this, like you know Python, Bash, or something like that? Nope, we don't have any anything of the kind at the moment. Just the C API uh, and the the Rust API, which is a work in progress. So you mentioned uh, the problem with the async bindings uh, in Rust and how the other libraries had similar issues with that. Uh, so how do you deal with things like lifetimes in Rust in this context? Uh, do you expose something that is strictly C-like and everything is considered static or is it possible to also take advantage of the Rust lifetime management? Yeah, I mean, uh, did you well, have something you want to say? Well, at the moment, we, uh, you know, the Rust API on the, on the part of data buffers is pretty similar to the C API, which is these pointers. This is a difficult issue to solve uh, in the general case. Um, in special cases where the user can ensure that the buffer is, is static, you have to produce references, or that the user can ensure that the request will be completed before the, the end of the lifetime. Sure, but in general, there might not be you know, a full solution, full general solution to avoiding unsafe uh, with these kind of things, especially when we then bring into uh, bring into the scenario the memory regions. Uh, 
I assume you looked at Tokayo and things like that. Yeah, so we, we've started looking at that. And it, it seems like one of the not 100% general solutions, but accepted solutions that, that are being used is that you have some kind of scoping API where you can say, I'm going to declare a scope. And within the scope, I can do I.O. and I can use libblock I.O. But um, outside the scope, I won't be able to. And that way, all my I.O. buffers and so on are going to be have a lifetime within the scope. And that way, we can guarantee that uh, stuff won't go out of scope. Yeah, async in, in particular will help a bit, you know, the, the Rust async, because then uh, we can ensure that after the call actually is completed, the buffer doesn't need to stay alive anymore, right? So that, that part solves it a bit. Uh, but if the user doesn't want to use Rust async, or if the user uses Rust async and memory revisions, uh, we probably will still need to have some insight in there. Uh, it's unclear, yeah. All right. If there are no more questions, thank you very much. Have a nice day.